JP, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, JP, it's really good to have you on the show. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. You have had a very extensive leadership career. Uh, you've worked at companies like Atex, Ensign, Exeosoft, and obviously now you're the president at Lightspeed. So uh, there's a lot that we want to talk to you about today, but I thought that a good place for us to kick off is to rewind and say in your entire career, uh, has there been a memorable boss or a leader that you've reported to, whether good or bad, that uh, you have memories from or, or that you recall? Yeah, so my, my, actually, my, one of my first bosses was probably my best. Um, so it was at France Telecom, and at the time, I just graduated. I was in I was in product management, kind of kind of weirdly enough, and um, I was so at the time we were doing specifications, and it was the first internet services. And this guy was called Osman Sultan. He was half Lebanese, half French, and uh, we were in France Telecom Multimedia, so we were growing the company like crazy. And uh, yeah, probably my most memorable, and taught me a lot about uh, you know leadership and people. So, what was it that you think he did particularly well, if you remember? Um, I think ultimately uh, there were two things. First, I think he made me believe in myself. So he was encouraging me to, to make decisions. And so he was empowering me basically to, to do a good job. And he let me just run with what I thought was right. Um, and, and then we had a very strong personal relationship. So he was kind of a mentor and very quickly he became someone I would look up to. And he, he would, uh, I knew he would be here to course correct but uh, without the, the negative sides, of course, correcting. And you know, it was more of a supporting and upli uplifting relationship. And uh, so I did a lot of mistakes and he helped me out and, and helped me see the, the reality through all of this. Yeah, so he, you said that he helped you believe in yourself. Um, was there anything particular that he did that you know, basically helped you believe in yourself? Yeah, well, I, I think you know, when you're... When you're it was my first job so I was trying to be good and I, I think I was very driven so I wanted to succeed but you know you're full of doubts and you're you, you know you're learning and so I mean I was I was product manager of a very small group and every time I came with ideas he would support the idea and say yeah that's a great idea just try and do it but be careful not doing this mistake and this mistake but he basically let me run with my ideas and and actually I think that was the most rewarding for me it was to see I implemented a lot of things that had a huge return on investment. And um, so, so I think that's the first thing I, I, I do now when I, I lead people is I want them to own the decisions and, and grow. And so I, I think for that, it was just, just great to see someone who you go into a company, you're full of doubts and just is empowering you to you know, make mistakes and learn and grow um, and always here to kind of has your back when, when, when you're kind of lost. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So uh, you talked about when uh, you're leading teams. Uh, do you remember some of, you know, before we talk about how you lead teams today, if we, if we were to dial back and think about some of the first teams that you were responsible for, uh, what were some of your early management mistakes or, or things that you maybe don't do anymore? Yeah, I think, um, I think the first mistake is I, I, I had always very high standards to myself. And so I, I was under the impression that 100% of people inside of companies would be as driven as I was, and which is not the case. Now you know that in companies, there are people that are more cultural fit and people that are more, you know, the, the high outcome people. Um, and, and so I, I was a bit of a dictator, I think, in my first job. So uh, it did stick well with the people who were driven, but those who were not as driven as me uh, probably hated the relationship. So I, I tend, instead of trying to lift people, I would try and you know, be uh, um, more of an uh, authoritarian uh, leader, just saying you're going to this, this, this. And I realized very quickly that, you know, you, you need to, to think about other things than just outcome and, and think about personalities and how, how people work and how do you make people want to work with you. So I think I was so obsessed by the, 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 the outcome that I wasn't really taking care of people. And I was just, I was a dictator, very simply put, and I was too demanding um, and, and I don't think I was very liked by everybody. And I, I think uh, I see it a lot, you know, at Lightspeed, we, we coach a lot of young leaders. And I think the nuances of people is probably the most difficult thing to get when you're a leader. 
um, and, and especially when you're driven by success, uh, sometimes this success makes you almost scary or this, this drive makes you scary. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I think I was just not good at it. And then the other problem I had is um, I was leading people that were much older than me. So I was the youngest uh, leader in France Telecom's history for on, on, on the digital side. And I was a director at 23 years old. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of crazy when I think about it now, but uh, you know, all these older people were looking at me going, who's this guy who knows nothing about life and is kind of telling us what we should be doing. And I think then I realized, okay, it's not about telling, it's about supporting and being a good leader is not so much about being a, you know, a dictator. It's, it's about helping people make their mistakes and lift. And it's, it's a very different view, I think, uh, than what I had when I started. Two really interesting things you said. You said, um, you know, focusing on the outcomes uh, and not enough uh, about the people. Do you think that those things are mutually exclusive or is there like a way to make them work well together? They need to work well together. So to be a good leader, you need to be obsessed by the outcome and you need to ensure that everybody understands the level of quality you're expecting. And I think that's really what we've done so well at Lightspeed is, you know, we never fail, no matter how hard, you know, or how close we are, we just go the extra mile always. And I think, so that's one piece. So you need to, I think this is more of a, a culture. This is, you know, strongly ingrained values. But I think the way to get people to understand that is, is not by, you know, telling them you have to do that, but it's by explaining the why uh, behind the, 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 the this quest for, for the great outcome. And I think then what happens is when you have enough people that have that culture set, uh, it, it's just so tightly ingrained into your culture that everybody just goes in that direction. But I, I think for me, and I'm trying to think about it, but you know, when, when, if you say to someone, do this, and I want you to do this, and if you don't do this, you're going to get fired. It's a very different message than, hey, this is our culture. This is who we are as an organization. And if you want to be part of us, this is the outcome we're expecting, you know? And so it's just the, the, the how you do it that's different. The, the, the objectives are always the same. It's the, the question is how do you bring someone to want that as badly as you do? And that the, the way forward is certainly not to try and, you know, use scare tactics or, or, or be forceful uh, without really understanding, you know, the why. I think it's, it's fundamentally why we're we doing this. You know? yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So if I understand it correctly, it's um, you don't have to change the outcome or sacrifice the outcome. It's just you have to understand on a people level how to get them to buy into that outcome. And for everybody, it might be a slightly different version of that. Yeah, and I think everybody learns by mistakes. So, you know, you're a young leader, you make mistakes, uh, you, 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 and you adjust, you adjust. And I think smart people just adjust. And so I think... Um, yeah, and I, it's funny because every young leader has always the same kind of, you know, side effects, um, especially when they're driven. And I think it's um, it's funny because in the early days, I was putting a ton of pressure on these leaders. And now I tend to say, look, don't stress. We're going to get there. <laughs> you know, you've got time. You know, the, you know, a career gets built in many years and, you know, it, it has to be a sustainable career. So don't don't try and, you know, and jump the steps and. So I, I, it's funny because now I've become kind of the opposite of what I was when I was a young leader. So that's really interesting. So for all those young leaders out there, say that are managing people that are more experienced um, than them, like what advice would you give them? I think the biggest advice I would give is ask yourself how you can help the team and not how the team can help you. And, and so I think, especially with the more senior, don't try, you know, and, and, and know more than them because you won't. So I think what they expect or what people expect from a leader is someone that shields them and that supports them through what they're trying to build. So I think that's the biggest advice I, I always give is, okay, just ask your team how you can help them, how you can help them do a better job, how you can help them, how you can remove, you know, all the friction, how you can support them with, with, with their colleagues, um, so I, I think it's a young leader thinks that they need to know everything and tell their their teams what they should be doing. And I think a senior leader will will question how can I help my team and, and will be very open and humble 
with regards to you know um, their teammates. And so I think simple things like um, you don't have to know everything. And I think that's the other big thing with high achievers. They feel that if they don't know everything, they're going to be judged and they're not going to be respected. And it's like you don't have to know anything. You need to be sure that you, you, you understand your strengths and you need to understand how you're going to help your team succeed. And so become a servant to your teams. And of course, now there's, of course, they need to follow the guidelines and your culture and what's your mindset, but be a helping hand. Don't try and tell people what they should be doing and don't try and know everything because you'll never know everything. Yeah, I, I really like that framing. This just not what they're going to do for you, but what can you do for them? And I think that's 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 really wise advice. I, I really like that. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I did want to ask you about was I think if I if I have it correct, did you join Lightspeed? Were they at 10 million in sales or did you join right when that was happening? I, I, we were slightly under. We were around six million when I joined. Um, but the story here is I joined when they received the first uh, uh, real, you know, VC, so uh, seed round from from Excel. Um, yeah, and and it's very funny, Lightspeed, as a story because it was very profitable for the first, uh, you know, until it reached six million. But then it, the whole, I mean, the market is so big that someone had to help Lightspeed scale. And, uh, and that's really what I've, you know, I've been kind of helping back since day one, just put a lot of rigor because I, you know, I've always grown companies. That's pretty much my DNA. You look at uh, every company I've joined, we just scaled very rapidly. And again, you learn from, from, you know, from doing this, the, the good, the bad and the ugly. And so I think for me, the goal was to join Lightspeed, put a lot of rigor and, and really help DAX kind of paint the picture of how we're going to scale this organization and what is the, and, and, you know, I'm sure you, you you know that, but every company at every stage needs a different uh, methodology and a different recipe. I call it, I, I call myself the chef, and that's what I you know everybody that likes me knows I'm doing a soup, <laughs> and and it takes different ingredients to build a good soup at every step of the way of companies. So that and, and you know for the for the audience, Dax is uh, the CEO at Lightspeed, and and just for uh, reference, just to give people a sense of scale. Uh, you joined when they were six million in sales, and and roughly like what you know, where is Lightspeed today? Yeah, it was like I can't uh, talk about projections. Oh, we're public. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, uh, but yeah, we're we're in the hundreds of millions. Hundreds uh, of millions. Uh, yeah, and um, we were. I think I was employee forty four, um, and now we're almost uh, two thousand employees. Yeah, that's very, very impressive. So let's talk about some of the the rigor and some of the systems and, and, and things that you put into place. Like what was the like the first set of things that that you started to implement? And and for people who are you know at the stage and, and they're looking looking to bring in rigor into their teams and um, and you know it, it's hard because in the beginning you're focusing on just having the right product and getting the product market fit and once something has started to work, like what are the immediate next steps? Like what's your playbook when you go into a company? Yeah, I think that the, well, the smaller the company, the more everybody does everything. And as a company scales, you need to specialize. And I think that's really the, the job I did. So, you know, when I joined, giving you simple examples, you know, we, everybody was doing pretty much everything. And, and so, and, and it's normal. And that's, you know, how a company is at that stage. But the problem then is what, what Lightspeed was facing is, and every startup faces the same problem is, you can't hire because when, you're, uh, when, when you need to scale, you need to hire a lot of people quickly. But if you expect everyone you're hiring to know everything inside of the company, it's not a scalable model. So I think that's the first thing we put in place when I got to Lightspeed was to say, okay, let's hyper-specialize people. And so, you know, support in, instead of being just you know, all support supporting everything. Let's put level one, level two, level three support. When you're in sales, let's break out SDRs from, 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 from you know, from, from business development and, and from account management. And then, um, then, then we put in place, you know, onboarding. And so basically what you try and do, and even, you know, it's a very funny one, but our HR person was also doing uh, billing. <laughs> you know, and that's because you're like, okay, you want to do billing, do billing. And that's what happens when you're small. So, the, the first, uh, let's say, six to 12 months, I spent my days just restructuring the groups so that people had a smaller scope. And, and the reason why we did that is then when you hire someone, instead of saying, hey, you got to do HR and billing and 
All you need to do is know how to recruit. All you need to do is know how to do SDRs. And so just job definitions, rescoping the roles. And I think also looking at the hierarchy and looking at the, because I think often when you're small, you don't realize it, but the structures you put in place are maybe valid for small companies. But as you scale, uh, I think the, the structure of the organization becomes the most important thing. Organizational excellence and, and ensuring that, uh, it, it's, it's a soup, going back to my soup, in, ensuring that you have the right ingredients uh, and, and that everybody understand what their ingredient is and then, uh, and then ensuring we just have the right balance of all the ingredients. And I think that's how we got to scale is you, you structure, you measure. That's the other big thing I implemented was measuring <laughs> and, and making people understand it's not about feelings. It's not about uh, you know, uh, impressions. It's about data. And so getting every team to figure out, okay, what are the four or five OKRs I'm going to look at? And at the time it was KPIs, but the same, I mean, pretty much the same kind of logic, but what are you going to look at? What are the, the four or five things you need to measure every day? And, and from there, we, we built up kind of the whole company uh, measurement. And then from there, it's very easy for someone like me to build the soup and say, okay, this data point is, is degrading because we don't have enough people. Let's hire one person there. And then just ensuring that we look at the right data points and that we have uh, um, the teams that were, were, were segmented. And I think then it just becomes easier because I strongly believe that you, know, you need to stare at a data point for it to improve. And if you have a data point that is, I don't know, uh, um, oh yeah, at the beginning of life, we does wait times because our wait times in support. So I was like, okay, what do we want to do? Okay, wait times should be under two minutes. Cool. Let's stare at that number every day. And then, you know, those wait times went from 15 minutes all the way to our, our numbers because from the moment people know this is, and just share that with your teams and from the moment they know what they need to improve on and from the moment you give them, and you know, at the early days, we didn't even have a data system. We would, I would have all the leaders print out the Excel sheet every day with all the names of the, because we were small, you know, we had maybe 10 support agents, but we would have all the weight, the average wait times, we would have the satisfaction rate per agent. We, and, and just doing that, it created a nice little healthy competition within the teams. And it forced us to become much better at those, those data points. So that just, sorry, long-winded answer, but that's really what we focused on at the beginning was say, okay, let's narrow the scopes, let's measure, let's set you know, the, the, the benchmarks. And then from that point, let's just improve every, every week. And what I launched also at the same time is a cadence. So I'm, people at Lightspeed would say that I'm very rigorous with data, very rigorous with, with uh, I'm obsessed by cadence. And so what we did also is we, we, we put in place a Monday morning uh, weekly business review where basically every leader of all the groups inside of Lightspeed were in there. They had their benchmarks and they had to, we had to just look at all the data points. And from there, when a data point was not working, we would, we would talk about it and we'd try and find solutions. So, and that was, yeah, for the two, two, two first years, I think that was a very painful, by the way, for all the existing people. Because they're, and I think that's another big thing in my mind is the leaders you have from one to 50 uh, and then from 50 to 200 and 200 to 1,000 and 1,000, um, they're never the same. And I think that's where we've been very strong at Lightspeed is we've managed to keep those leaders, but we coach them. We, 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 strongly, believe at, um, we strongly believe in building people from within. So that's the other big piece of our culture. And so if you look at, um, I don't know, our CMO today at Lightspeed, Lori, she was receptionist when I joined. And she oh, did, wow, that's crazy. She did pretty much every job at Lightspeed. But at the same time, we had a PhD in maths at the reception. I was like, why are you at the reception? And she's like, I just wanted to join Lightspeed. I'm sure this company is going to be successful. And Lori basically, and I think it's a very good example, she's done everything. She's done data. She's done systems. She's done SDRs. And, and, and so, you know, you build a true deep knowledge. And I think... Most of our execs have a very, and I think Asha, not a good example. All we're very lucky that a lot of our execs have been with us forever, and they understand very deeply the the, the company. So let's dig into this cadence a bit more. So you call it a, a weekly business review, um, and do you still have those today? Like, can you break down how long it is, who attends, like what gets discussed? Yeah. So they've um, they've grown in 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 time because. You know, when you have five leaders and, and you're in one geography, and it's pretty straightforward. But now Lightspeed, we operate 
you know, we, even in, in Asia Pacific now, we have 400 people in, uh, in Sydney and, uh, and, and Auckland. So they've grown over time, but they, it's always been the same principles. The principles are, so it's 8.30 every, every Monday morning. And at, in the early days, it was 8.30 to 9, uh, sorry, to 9.30, so it was an hour. Then it moved to 10, and now we're at 10.45. So we started at 8, 8.30, and we go to 10.45. And really, we review every single uh, piece of the business. And so it's evolved over time because at the beginning, when we started, it was purely direct. So we had functions and every functional leader would, would, would report. And, and so um, what happens? Like, do they just come in and say, here are my, my numbers. Here's what happened last week. Here's how we're tracking against goals. Yeah. So we review. So over time, we've built, we have, a, I think it's something like close to 20 people now that do data. So we have Looker is at the core of everything that we do. And we have, you know, automated dashboards. In the early days, it was manual, so people just show up with their Excel sheet. But for me, the most important was to um, have the cadence always on the same data sets, because you need to have the benchmark, you need to look. And what happened over time is we, we added a number of data sets. So now, I mean, yeah, we, we, could, um, we could go on. I mean, every group now has so many data points that it's becoming a bit un, unmanageable. So, so we went through this phase of more and more and more. Then we started um, opening offices in Europe. So then what we had was the beginning of a matrix. So we had the functional leaders and then we had the, the, the geographies. Um, and that went all the way to about uh, six months ago. So, you know, first two years, let's say it was just direct and we started having Europe. And now we just reorganized about six months ago where now we have, um, we have three ways of looking at the business. We have uh, the functional way of looking at it. Then we have what we call GMs, and these are people in charge of all the industries and where we operate. So these are basically mini CEOs at light speed of every industry. And then we have geographies. So it's become, let's say, more and more complex. And actually, we went through a phase of building a ton of data sets, and now we're back to, okay, let's simplify because these meetings are too long. So what we do now is we, we yeah, we've found, I think, the right balance of data sets, but it's like... If I'm in sales, it's going to be, how am I doing month over month, year over year? Um, it's going to be uh, looking at uh, LTV to CAC. It's going to be at, uh, at looking at my cost of a marketing lead. It's looking at um, growth. And, and then what we do is every function. So if I look at marketing, it's growth year over year, month over month, cost of a lead. If I look at SDRs, it's qualify rates year over year, month over month. Then if I look at, close, at sales, it's close rates, average ticket size. So it goes very, very deep, but every department... Basically, it's it's a, no matter how deep it goes. Fundamentally, now we have company OKRs, so we we measure every week against those. Then it all cascades down into all the uh, uh, regional OKRs, functional OKRs, and then into the industry OKRs. So, and we just review that. It's a bit, um, yeah. We 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 basically. And so is everyone. I was just going to say, so is everyone uh, there for throughout the meeting? Like all of the leaders are also aware of every other part of the business. So it's not like people come and present and then they take off. No, I think it's good that everybody's there because it creates, first of all, healthy competition uh, in, in a good way. You know, uh, just, I don't know if I'm uh, like right now, Australia for us is on fire. I mean, it's the it's crazy growth over there. So Nick, who's the ge geography lead of Australia, then we have Adrian. That we have Mike and Sherelle for the U.S. for North America. It's great that they all see their numbers because it, it, it creates a healthy discussion also. It's like, oh, how come you guys are, you know, at, I think in Europe we have close to 50% uh, um, qualify rates. And, and so I think it just creates a healthy view on the world. And, and, and I think also the other thing for me is the, the, the bigger we become, the more you have distortion in communication. And so I think a lot of my time and you know, I'm more of a parrot now than a, than a chef. I just spend my days, you know, ju just doing meetings and repeating, okay, this is where we're heading. These are the OKRs and ensuring that there's no distortion because what happens with, the, you know, very simply put, what it's, it's, uh, it's roughly 10 a.m. here. Uh, Australia is going to bed now. Right. And, or right. actually they've been in bed now because it's 14, 14, 15 hours, 14, 15 hours, depending on the time of the year ahead. So, it's very difficult to keep the, you know, to keep the messaging sound. And, and I think 
it's the most important thing in companies our size is communication and ensuring that everybody is aligned. So going back to your answering your question, I think it's good that everybody's on the same meeting. And that's a challenge just by itself because, um, you know, because of time zones. But it's, 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 um, it's a very good thing because it ensures that at least all of our leaders are aligned and everybody sees eye to eye. And I think it's very important also that when I have strong or important messages to give or so I'm, I'm going to start the meeting, start with me giving my review of the week. What, you know, I looked at all the data sets on Sunday and, and my review is this is what's great. This is not what's great. And also use that to just talk about my feelings, you know, like it, it could be uh, anything around, Hey, I think communication is degraded or I think, and, and just getting everybody aligned, I think is a very strong. So cadence and alignment, um, I think is the most important thing in our stage to just be sure that we're an army and we're, you know, we're, we're all moving in uh, um, and, and we're not, you know, we don't have distortion of messaging because it happens everywhere right now. And it's very important to keep everybody aligned. And so those meetings are very important. Yeah. And I like what you said, which is like, you turn from a chef to a parrot. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, with that many people, it makes sense that there would be distortion and and repetition uh, can become really, really important. Uh, so JP, this has been uh, really, really insightful. I mean, what an ins a great inside view of you know how you run a 2000 person organization and growing. Um, so one of the questions that we leave uh, all of our guests with is for all the managers and leaders out there uh, looking to get better at their craft, uh, any resources, tips, or final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave them with? I mean, I think it all starts with uh, having a good leader and, 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 and having someone who can be your mentor. And I have a number of people that I, that I, I look up to. I'm on the board of, of, you know, other incredible companies. And so I think that's the first step is just don't be scared to connect with people who can, who can teach you because I think it's all learning, learning. But I, apart from that, you know, there's... <laughs> I just think that the best way to learn is, is to, and the best way to be a leader is, as I said at the beginning, is try and be, try and think about how you can help your teams instead of thinking how the teams are going to support you. Um, and I, I think then you just got to try and it's, 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 it's difficult, but try and always be uplifting and try and be the, the you know, this person that brings everybody up. Because I think um, no matter how big or small the company, you know, when you're a leader, you have challenges every day. You have, you have highs and lows every day and you got to deal with them. And I think trying to understand that everyone in your group is living the same scenarios and, and you have to be the, uh, and, and maybe that's my style. My style is I'm, I'm always very positive and I always want to lift people up and I always believe in goals that are, you know, very, very sometimes I can't scare people actually when I'm doing that but I think just try and stay positive and and try and think about how to help your people but it, it's there's no secret sauce quite frankly to this there's the only way you learn is by making mistakes and and hopefully you learn from those mistakes and you don't do them twice and I think that's more important than uh, than any kind of advice I could give or just try and Learn from your mistakes. I mean, I know it's kind of a cheesy thing, but that's pretty much the story of my career for what it's worth. And a great place to end it. JP, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks, Aiden. Nice talking to you.